Hello YouTube, I am Orange Peter, and today we're going to be talking about how to make infinite terrain generation. We're going to be answering many questions today. How do I split my terrain into chunks? How do I make my chunks seamless? How do I go about loading and unloading these chunks? And also, if I modify these chunks, how do I go about saving that so that so that it's not lost in the whole loading and unloading process? We're going to be answering all those questions and more. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, here's a starting point. As you can already tell, I'm using Game Maker. If you would not like to use Game Maker, you can uh, go ahead and follow along, and you should be able to get the gist of the concept so you can apply it to your own project. Uh, this particular project is where I left off in my uh, Game Maker top down terrain generation tutorial. So there'll be a link in the description to that. And if you haven't watched that, that actually requires my Terraria tutorial, so you're going to want to start with Terraria train generation, then top-down train generation, and then come over here. So there'll be links in the description to all of that stuff down below. All right. So with that out of the way, this is where this is what we're this is where we're at. Top-down terrain generation. Uh, if I press space, it regenerates the terrain as you would expect. So as you may know, whenever I do long tutorials, I like to go ahead and break them down to a series of steps. That way you'll have an easier time following along and we have like a more of a logical sequence of what we're doing. So for today's tutorial I have five steps for you guys. Number one, we're gonna make some minor adjustments, just some tweaks we need to make to the, to this system of to make it work I guess. Number two, we're going to chunk eyes the environment. We're gonna split up our generation into making a series of chunks. Number three, we're going to deal with loading and unloading the chunks. Number four, we're going to go ahead and set up the loading unloading in such a way that we can adjust the terrain, which is a little bit more involved. And then number five, I'm going to make some final notes. So this is this can be particularly useful for those of you who aren't following along Game Maker. I'm going to be talking about some general general ideas and what you need to keep in mind if you're implementing this in your own project. All right. So with that, let's. Uh, jump into the tutorial. All right, so step one, some minor tweaks. Currently our terrain is kind of in an archipelago format. I want it to be more of the 50-50 land water structure. Just a uh, preference. So I'm gonna jump into my get Z color and I'm gonna change the water level to 50 and that'll, that'll fix that. Okay, next, I'm gonna make a slight adjustment to get per the noise 2D. Um, I use these variables uh, chunk size in here However, this doesn't actually correspond to chunks, and I'm going to be having another variable called chunk size in this tutorial, and it won't cause any errors because their scoping is different, but just to keep you guys from being confused if you look at this in the future, I want you guys to all kind of na rename these variables from chunk size to, I don't know, sample, sample delta. Chunk size becomes sample delta, just to avoid you guys getting confused at some point. So I'm going to replace all of them in the get Perlin noise 2D script, and I'm going to jump into get Perlin noise, and we're going to do the same thing. Okay, so that's out of the way. I guess we can also go ahead and rename chunk index to uh, I don't know sample index. All right, that's better. Okay, then now that's done. Next. Let's see, we're going to need to go ahead and create um, a player, right? Because we're not going to really know how, whether it's infinite or not if we don't have some means of exploring the infinite terrain, right? So I'm going to go ahead and create an object. I'm going to call it O player. In the creation, I can make it start out in the center of the room. Next, in the sub event, I'm going to go ahead and program the movement. Uh, delete that and, that and step uh, right. Oh, I can use my compact movement statement. I talked about this in this tutorial once. Link in the description if you want to see that. Okay, so that's the compact movement script. Um, there, okay, that should take care of the four directional movement. And additionally, we're going to pan the screen to make our keyboard player centered on it. Screen. And then last for the player, we're going to add some drawing to uh, 
so we know where it is, you know. Alrighty, so this was all fairly basic stuff, stuff you probably should know already. So here we're just changing setting the color to yellow, we're changing the opacity to 0.5, and then we're drawing a circle with those settings. And of course we're resetting all the information over here. And the step event is all pretty basic movement stuff, and then the creation we're just setting the position. So let's see, if we go and add our player to the room, go and add our player to the room, and play, we should be able to move around the room. Uh, all right, so now our oh, I don't see a player there, and I can't seem to move it. Did I make a mistake? Got a player. Got a generator. Oh right, we need to set up views. Nine sixty, five forty, nine sixty, and five forty. <laughs> All right, and then our player additionally needs to have depth negative one, so it shows up above our terrain. Okay, now now I think it should work. All right, there's our player, and we can move around, and then our the finiteness of our terrain becomes blatantly obvious. All right, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna make the player a little bit smaller. I don't like the way it looks right now. Um, yeah, let's make radius ten instead of twenty, and then. Last but not least for the minor adjustments, I'm gonna make a slight change to our generator code. All right, so I've just made some slight adjustments to our code. Um, I don't expect you to make those adjustments. I just made them to illustrate this point. So here's my terrain, and I made it a generate to the left and upwards. And as you can see, it doesn't look quite right. And this is actually because when I made my terrain generation top-down tutorial, I didn't take into account negative numbers. I, I think I saw it, I knew about it, but I thought it would be too hard to fix, and I it was out, outside the domain of the tutorial anyway, so I didn't see the point in accounting for that. Uh, today it is within the domain of the tutorial, so I'm going to tell you how to fix it. So jump into our get, get noise 2 d and right here after the TX, add the code that I'm about to add. That fixes it. And I'm not going to go into detail of why this fixes the negative issue. Um, if you look at it and think about it for a little I'm sure you, you can figure it out. but um, the details of why this works is not really part of, it doesn't have anything to do with the topic of the tutorial, so I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, now when we play it, you can see our terrain looks good. No? Interesting. Something else I need to do, I bet. I bet that needs to be ABS. I think that's what it is. Yes, that did it. Okay. So, got to have, um, absolute values on, on these additionally. Yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah, that, you can see that, that makes the terrain look okay at negative. Alright. Um, okay. Alright, we are at step two, which is chunk eyes. So we're going to set up the base of our chunk system. So I'm going to create an object, I'm going to call it O chunk. And it's basically going to take over a lot of the functionality that our generator has, take, has taken on. So, um, let's see. Randomizes and generator, seeds and generator, block size can be generator. With the, we're going to actually want to change this to be... Because um, right now we no longer have a particular size of our room anymore, right? So, this is actually going to be chunk size... And I'm going to say let's say chunk size 64, and the width and height is has becoming relevant. Okay, and this grid and generate is all going to be within the chunk now. All right, so in the creation of the trunk chunk chunk, I'm going to we're just going to have its own grid, and then we're going to generate the terrain. All right, and then. This, um, the size of the grid is going to correspond to the chunk size, and we're actually going to make that a global variable. We're going to need to make a couple of these global variables. Um, so over here, right at the beginning, I'm going to declare some global variables so that way they can be accessed everywhere. Uh, C is going to need to be global. Um, block size is going to need to be global. I actually take it back. Let's, let's not worry about seed. Seed is more of some, that's more of something covered last tutorial. We, we, to have it taken care of. 
So block size is going to need, need to be global. Chunk size is going to need to be global. Um, and there's going to be more later, but that's all for now. So over here, the width and height are actually both going to be chunk size. The generate is only going to need to generate over our chunk. It's going to be zero up until the number of blocks in our chunk. So chunk size is actually represents how many pixels wide it is. So how many blocks is going to be chunk size divided by the block size? Because block size is how many pixels wide our block is. So chunk size divided by block size. Here we go. And then when we're generating the Perlin noise, we actually want this to be offset by whatever our chunk position is. So that's going to be x divided by block size. Y divided by block size. Plus, there we go. There we go. So we've offset the the train by our current the current block that our chunk is at and then ij is gonna be yeah that's about right okay now the drawing of our generator this is also going to be largely transferred over to our chunk so i'm going to delete that um and then our chunk we're going to go into the draw and, and we're going to draw this thing and it's going to again it's going to be chunk size divided by block size that's the number of blocks high and wide we are. Chunk size by a block size. And then let me think what's next. Um, it's also going to be offset by our x position and y position. x, y plus, x plus, y plus. And there we go. That takes care of the drawing. OK. So now our generator doesn't really do anything. It it di take, dictates the global vert settings like our block size and our chunk size. It dictates the seed, and then we have this little code here to restart the game. That's all our generator does right now. So we're going to add something to actually generate all of our chunks. So four of our i equals zero. I is less than uh, room width, and then i plus equals chunk size. So we're just going to generate them in the same fashion as they were earlier, just filling the whole screen. J less than room height. And then we're going to go ahead and create at i comma j o chunk. Brilliant. Okay, so now we're, we're ch creating chunk space out the, the space throughout the room. And let's hit play and. This should look exactly the same as it was earlier, just split into chunks. Brilliant. Just same old, same old. And just to show you that split in chunks, in addition to all this drawing, we're going to draw a big rectangle around the whole thing. We're going to set the color to red. And then we're going to draw a rectangle from our x position over to our chunk size. Oh, x plus chunk size. Outline is false. Something just occurred to me, doesn't matter, but in the player, I reset the draw color to black, thinking that was the default, but the default is actually white. I'm sorry. I reset it to white, thinking that was the default, but the default is actually black. Misspoke there. All right. Fix that. Uh, that doesn't matter, but yeah. Okay. So now when we play, it's going to draw a rectangle around each chunk, and you see not what I wanted you to see. It's going to be a true. It's an outline, not a filled rectangle. So these are our chunks. This is all everything that's. This is how it's split up. And because we're using the same Perlin noise algorithm, it, it's seamless. It's just, we're just offsetting it. Each chunk is in charge of a different part. Okay, brilliant. We split our terrain into chunks. Now for step three, the loading and unloading of chunks. Okay. Um, I'm going to organize our scripts because we're going to be making several more. So I'm going to go ahead and create a group and I'm going to call this group Perlin Noise Stuff. So everything related to our Perlin Noise algorithm is going to go into here. So we shouldn't have touched that really anymore. And that's all that stuff. And now I'm going to create another group. We're going to call this one Chunk Stuff. So let's first take care of the despawning of the chunks. So we're going to create a, well, okay, let me talk about usage first. So we're going to add step event to our chunk, 
So if we're going to say if in despawn range instance destroy. Um, if we're far enough from the player, we want to despawn to so that way we're not dealing with this chunk anymore. So let's create that script. Oops, I'm creating it over here. And we're going to call it in despawn range. And we're going to say you're in despawn range if you're more than 300 pixels away from the player. Got it? I'm actually going to name this differently. If point in despawn range. So here when we're saying point in oops, point in despawn range and we're going to pass in our, our x and y value asking whether that's in despawn range. Actually we're going to pass in our, the center of our chunk so that'll be more accurate because x, y is top left but we want to pass in the center, so we're going to add, the, add chunk size divided by 2 to each of these parameters to make it our center point. Okay, brilliant. If point in despawn range. Okay, so let's read in our point of our xx equals argument 0, of our yy equals argument 1, and then our distance to the player is going to be equal point distance o player dot x player dot y x x y y beautiful all right so that's our distance and we're in despawn range if that distance is greater than 300 so return d greater than 300 so this is going to be true if d is greater than 300 it's going to be false otherwise <sighs> all right i think that should do it let me hit play and all right so it still created all of them. It still did that in the um, in the generator. However, now if they're in the despawn range, or which is all these towards the edge are, edge are in the despawn range, then they got deleted. And you can see if I move to the left, it will delete more because they they leave the range for spawning. Okay. Now let's take care of spawning all of them. So that's going to be taking care of the generator in the sub event. Of the generator, we're going to actually be calling a script called spawn chunks. I'm going to create a script for spawn chunks. Spawn chunks. And let's see, how's this going to work again? So we're going to loop roughly over our spawn region. So our spawn region is going to be a little smaller than the than despawn region. I'm actually going to I think I'm going to create some more variables in, in here. I'm going to call it a despawn radius and spawn radius. And despawn radius, we just used it, except it's hard coded. Hard coded. Despawn radius equals 300. And then our spawn radius is going to be equal to 200. Okay, brilliant. And we're going to go ahead and change this to despawn radius. All right. Let's see how I do this. Okay. So, we're basically checking a rectangle around the player and the the size of the rectangle is going to be the spawn radius times 2. Okay. So, I'm going to say I'm going to just pull in the player's x value and call it pxpy. Next thing I'm going to do might seem a little bit odd, I suppose. Let me see how to explain this. So we want to make sure that when we're creating these these chunks that are aligned to, to the to the chunk grid, we don't want to just be creating one in the center of another one. So we're going to go ahead and align the, this player point to the chunk grid. So I'm going to say minus equals px percent chunk size, and same over here. Modulus is a wonderful tool. I find myself using it all the time. Um, I have a tutorial talk about modulus. So I guess I won't get too in depth over here, but basically, um, by subtracting this, we're making it divisible by chunk size. So if px was uh, 76, our chunk size is 64, right? So we want it to round down to the nearest chunk size. So the way I do that is I take the remainder, which in this case, if I take 76 divided by 64, the remainder would be 12. So I subtract out the remainder, and it'll be 64. That's my quick explanation of what I'm doing there. All right, so now we want to loop in a rectangle around that point. Um, I'm going to create our chunk radius. 
So it's spawn radius, except we want this also to be divisible by chunk. So I'm going to go ahead and divide that by chunk size, and I'm going to seal it. Seal means round up to the nearest integer. So now I've got the number of chunks I can fit in this radius rounded up. And then I'm going to go and multiply that by chunk size. So now I'm going to do this loop. I'm going to start from i equals uh, px minus chunk radius. And I'm going to keep and I'm going to keep looping over the range till px is equal to px plus chunk radius. And oh boy, and then we're going to say i plus equals chunk radius or chunk size rather. Okay. So 4 of rj equals py minus chunk radius j less than equal to py plus radius j plus equals chunk size. Okay. So this is going to be looping over generally the region where chunks can be spawning. So now there's a couple things we want to do. We want to create a chunk at this point if not chunk loaded uh, i comma j. But rather, if there's already chunk there, we don't want to add a new one. We only want to add one there if there, there is not one there already. And the other thing is we want to make sure this point is within our spawn region. So point in spawn, what was my name you mentioned for the despawn? Range, okay. If points in spawn range. And the point would be i comma j. Actually, again, we want it to be the center of the chunk, so we got to add that chunk size over 2 to both of these guys. Okay, so we have two scripts we need to write over here. With the chunks loaded and point in spawn range. We're going to do point in spawn range first because that's easier. So I'm going to actually duplicate the point in despawn range. And I'm going to rename it to point in spawn range. Ooh, ooh. Okay, brilliant. <sighs> All right, um, so it's in despawn range. If we're, our rate, if the distance is less than our spawn radius, okay, that's all we need to do there. That'll tell us this points in spawn range, and then got that brilliant. Okay, now for the other one, it's going to be a little bit trickier. We're going to actually create a map. So the purpose of this chunk loaded, which we haven't created yet, I'll write, I'll write that. Purpose of this chunk loaded script is we want to quickly um, determine if this chunk is loaded or not. So we need, some, we need a data structure where we can quickly access an element or quickly check if an element is there. Additionally, we don't care what order the elements are stored and we just want to be able to quickly find it. So if you want, whenever you want to access elements quickly and you don't care about the order they're stored in, that is the per that's kindling. That's the, that's the perfect situation for maps. So GameMaker has maps, or hash sets is it also called. Um, so we're going to go ahead and use that. So we're going to create a global variable, which we're going to call chunk loaded set. And we're going to set that equal to chunk loaded set. We're going to set equal to a new map, DS map create. All right, and this map is going to store which chunks are loaded, which ones aren't. Now, when we initially create a ch create a chunk, oops, the create event. Oh, let's see, we do all this stuff, but I'm actually going to call. I'm going to take all this stuff and I'm going to put that in a script called load chunk. So we create a script, load chunk, and then over here, I'm going to take all that and put that over here. So whenever we load a chunk, we're going to add this chunk to our chunk loaded set. DS map add um, chunk loaded set and then the key we're going to get to in a second and then the value, I'm just take a one um, since well in programming there's actually two things, there's hash maps and hash sets in game maker they just have maps but we're going to use it like a set so the idea of a set is sets don't have values assigned to them elements are either in the set or they're not so in here we don't really care about the values, so I'm just going to give it a 1 because they don't have value assigned in the set. All right. Okay, now for the key. We need a way to uniquely identify various chunks based off their x and y value. So since we're going to do this a lot, I'm going to create another function for that, get key x, y. 
I know we're jumping around making a lot of scripts over here. Make another one over here called get key. And one of the nice things about um, chunks, or sorry, one of the nice things about maps is things can be indexed by strings. So we're going to make our key a string. So I'm going to take in our x and y value, which are going to be used to uniquely identify the chunk. So var x equals argument 0, var y equals argument 1, and then return string xx plus we're going to add an underscore plus string yy and, and also rather than having these x and y values be in terms of room coordinates I'm going to change them up to be in terms of um, chunk index coordinates so I'm going to divide them out by chunk size it doesn't really matter but I think it's going to be cleaner that way okay so got that we can identify a key now whenever we create a new chunk it's going to be it's going to add itself to the set likewise whenever we um a chunk get deleted so i'm going to destroy event uh destroy event we're going to actually unload the chunk unload chunk so we've got load chunk and got unload chunk on load chunk and in load chunk we added it to the map like that this time we're going to delete it from the map so instead of adding it we're going to delete and we don't need to specify value because we're taking it away okay so now when chunks are in existence they'll be loaded into this map when they're not existent they won't be in the map so now for this chunk loaded script we can easily check whether a chunk is loaded by checking whether or not it's in that map. So we can do DS map exists. DS map exists indicating whether or not it's in the map. The map is chunk uh, loaded set. I wish I could have think of a better name of that for this. Um, and the key is get key x y and actually uh, x x y y. And then. Uh, chunk loaded is we're going to take a two parameters to say so we can ask which chunk is loaded so var x equals argument zero var y y equals argument one okay and then we need a parenthesis closing there all right so we went quite a way long ways down the rabbit hole there um on load y oh i have two l's there went quite a ways down down the stack of the rabbit hole so let's, let's let's jump back up to where we were earlier which was in generate no it wasn't generate it was in spawn chunks right here so now we have a way to determine whether the chunk is loaded we're checking that that set that hash set slash map to figure out whether it's loaded, loaded and we're also using point in range to figure out whether or not it's in range so if if it's not there yet and this position should have a chunk we're going to make a chunk that's what we're saying here so instance create i comma j o chunk and that should take care of the loading of the chunk additionally in our generator we should no longer need this stuff initially create them the spawn chunks should create them uh, we got an error we need an extra parenthesis there Let's try it again. We got another error. Uh, unexpected symbol and expression. What's wrong with this? Oh, that should be a semicolon, not a colon. All right. Oh, this is terribly slow. Like really, really slow. I'm going to need to figure out what's wrong here. Um, cause I'm doing something wrong. Okay. Last time when I had this happen is because it was constantly creating these things. And it got a vertex oversize. Yeah, it's probably constantly creating. It's, it's probably constantly doing this instance create when it shouldn't be. Um, let me just do a debug statement. Actually, I'm going to use my nice handy dandy debug script called print. I'm going to type it out real quick. I have a tutorial about this debug statement, and I'll link to that.
All right. So this is just how I like to do debugging because I, I don't like typing out show, print show debug message every time. I like to just type out print. And additionally, I don't have to do that whole string concatenation. I can I can do something like that, and I don't have to convert these explicitly convert these tens into strings. Okay, so I just like this a lot better. Uh, currently, whenever I want to print debug stuff, I just type out this whole script because it makes me feel better. But hopefully, I'm I'm gonna make use of that later. So here we go. I can I'm gonna just print loaded. Yeah, it would be kind of silly if this had turned out to be the only time I use print. But yeah, I just think that the standard debug is kind of annoying. All right, um, I can already hear my my computer starting to have some problems, and you can see it's printing that over and over again. When it really shouldn't be, we shouldn't be creating any more chunks right now. Like we only have like what a dozen maybe squares, but if I if I scroll up through here. You can see it was printing out loaded over and over and over and over again. Okay, so this obviously isn't working. One of these things is true when it shouldn't be. So, why would that be? Point. I'm gonna guess it chunk loaded because that was more involved of the two things. Um, so script uh, chunk loaded. I did this last time too. It's kind of useless if we don't return this. Return whether or not the map exists. Return. So yeah, GameMaker just, since we didn't have a return there, GameMaker just assumed that it was returning true. And it was always true. Now when we hit play, I think, or my computer shouldn't crash on itself. Alright. Um, okay, it's not printing out loaded anymore. That's good. As we move around, it loads more. Okay, this is this is really good. It's not really slow. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So there you go. This is basically what you came here for, I think. I can move around to my heart's content, and it'll create new chunks as I go. In addition, I'll despawn old ones to make sure that I don't mess up my computer. So just to make things a little more clear, I'm going to go to the player, and I'm going to draw some more circles. Okay. So we should have two big circles being drawn. All right, there we go. So the green ones are in our spawn range. If you're if if, it, if chunks are in that circle, they should be spawned. And remember, it's the center of the chunk. So if you look at these corners, they're not actually being spawned there because the center is not in that range. And then as soon as they leave the red circle, they despawn. So you can see, this these are outside the the green circle, so they would not be spawned there. But they don't get despawned until um, they leave the red circle. And there you go. It should look a lot more clear what's happening now. All right. So one thing you might be wondering, why didn't you just have one circle saved in the circle spawn if it's outside the circle despawn? Well, we might have a situation like this. So take this block right here. Right there, it should be desp If we're just going off one circle, inside the circle spawn, outside the circle de despawn. There it's outside the circle, it should, be, should, it should despawn. Now it's inside the circle, so it should spawn. If you're, as a player, doing something like that, it would constantly be spawning and respawning that chunk, which is pretty bad. Like, especially, well, depending on how, how vigorous the loading unloading process works, you're doing a lot of work you shouldn't be doing. So that's why we have this buffer zone. So it's really, it's only spawning and despawning if you're really going somewhere. Whereas if you're just kind of going in circles, it's not really spawning too many chunks. All right? And of course, in an actual game, their chunk size is probably much bigger than this. This is actually kind of small. Okay. So that was a whole lot of stuff to do, but I think we got some, a pretty cool result. Um, now we can move on to the next step, which is creating adjustable terrain. <sighs> okay, so to start off with, we need a way to adjust it to make sure to verify that's not working, if, if you will, before we kind of fix the problem. So in our set event of the chunk, we have, you know, this is our check for despawn. And now we're gonna do mouse interaction. Mouse interaction. Um, so you know what, this isn't particularly relevant to tutorial, so I'm just gonna copy this in. Okay, it's copied in. So let me just run through it real quick. We hit the mouse button. It's going to go through this check. It's gonna compute the mouse position relative to us. 
and this whole in X range thing and anding these is going to basically say if the mouse is close enough to us that it can change us. So okay. So then if it can change us, we're going to be looping through all of our blocks, all of our blocks in the grid, and we're saying, "Hey, is the mouse close to that block?" And if so, we're going to decrease the height at that block. You know, I'm going to pause, and of course, source code is in the description, guys. I, I didn't mention that yet, I don't think, but yeah, source code is in the description, so you can download source code and take a look at this if you like. Otherwise, I have the whole script right here. You can pause the video and look at it like that. All right, okay. So that's what that is. Now when I hit play, you can see how it works. And we can all see our problem. So the way it works is if I if I hold down the mouse button, I can I can modify this terrain. Kind of nice. And right there, I've made like a black pit. And you notice if if I if those chunks despawn and then I reload them, it's just gonna regenerate them based off the parallel noise. It doesn't save our changes. See? Okay, so that's the problem we're trying to solve now. So this is going to require some changes to our load and unload scripts. So in our unload, well, okay, let me put it this way. We're going to need a new map to store all of our chunk information. All right, so in our generator, we have our chunk loaded set, and now we're going to need our chunk map. Okay. And just like our chunk loaded set, our chunk map is going to be. And just like our chunk loaded set, our chunk map is going to just be a new map down here. Chunk map equals ds map create. Now, there's a difference between these two. This chunk loaded set, I, mean, I would actually consider a set, not a map, because we don't really care about the values. We only care if things are loaded into that set or not. Okay, a map is different. Map is going to have values associated with each key. So here, this this just a set of keys. Here, it's going to be a bunch of keys, but each key has a value associated with them. Okay. So in our scenario, I'm going to take advantage of a nice little little trick in Game Maker to represent each of our chunks as a long string, and that like big string is going to be the value associated with the keys in this map. All right. So let's do that. So in our unload chunk, we want to store our chunk as is into the chunk map. So we're going to say DS map. I'm going to say replace. I made a mistake the first time I went through here. I could say add, but the problem with add is when I store it for the first time, it's going to store it correctly. But after that, it, it won't change it, whereas we want to update that slot every time, so we do replace, not add. And replace, if, if it's not in there yet, replace has the same functionality as add, so don't have to worry about that. Okay, so in chunk map, we are going to replace, yeah, chunk map, we're going, we're going to replace the information in this chunk with the new information. So which, which chunk is going to be get key x, y, and then the information, and this is the key part. So I... All the information for this chunk is stored in a grid. You may not have it that way, so you might need to do things a little bit differently just to actually have all the information stored. But for me, all of the values are just in that grid. So grid has a handy dandy function called dsgrid write. And I can look that up over in the manual. DS grid right. This function can be used to convert DS grid into a string, which can be stored in an external file, for example. Turn string is not human readable string, but rather a dump of context contents of the data structure. Alright, so it's pretty brilliant. So it's basically gonna give us a string representation of the grid, which is exactly what we wanted. So Grid is the name that, that I gave it. All right, this will um, store our chunk into the chunk map. Okay, now we're going to do some stuff, different stuff in the load chunk. So we don't always want to regenerate the chunks. So if it's already been created, we or we actually want to want to load the one that's already been created. So basically, we're going to say if chunk exists, do the one thing. Otherwise, we're going to generate a new. 
So we're going to need to create that chunk exists script. And when I say exists, I want I'm talking about x y. R x x equals argument. Var y y equals argument one. All right. So um, return ds map exists. So now we're Rather than checking if it's loaded, which w it involves checking whether the index exists in the chunk loaded set, we're checking whether it exists, exists, whether we've created it before, in which case it would exist in our chunk map. I spelled exists wrong. X. So it's going to be chunk map this time. And the key is going to be get key xxyy. Brilliant. Okay, so if it exists, we want to to get our get it from the map. So ds map find value and call it str. So we're finding a value in the map, and it's gonna be chunk map and get key x comma y. There we go. So this is gonna be the string representation of our grid, and then we can read it into our grid using grid or sorry ds grid read. So this will take that same string and it'll convert it back over to a grid. So we want our grid to read from that string. Okay. Okay. So that should go load load it. And let's see. So if I make a little hole there and I run away and I come back, it's still there. And there you go. So now we have written to it and it actually saves the chunk with with that modification and it it um it maintains the modification even if we unload it all right so that's pretty awesome so that is pretty much everything for the tutorial we finished step four which was um taking care of the adjustable terrain um and i'm actually going to retroactively add a new step so step five is final notes but we're not quite ready for that yet i'm going to add step 4.2 Okay, so step 4.2 is fix memory issues. All right, so we've got a lot of data structures here. Oh, I saw this loaded thing. Let me change, remove that. Okay, fix memory issues. So we're working with a lot of data structures here, and we've actually been kind of sloppy with data structures because if you don't remove them, if you don't delete them when you're done with them, it's going to stay in memory. So right now we've got some memory leaks, like a ton of memory leaks in our program. So if I hit space to restart it, it will tell us how much memory was used. So over here it says 4609, yada yada yada. That's how much memory was used. And you can tell this memory leak because if we restart it again, you can see that grows. So as it hit space more and more, that number just keeps growing. And if we go on with this long enough, we're actually going to get a memory overflow and GameMaker is going to crash. But you see the memory just keeps going up because we're not deallocating all these chunks that we're loading. All right. So we're, I'm, we're gonna make some adjustments and we're gonna know that we're done when this number stops changing. So first off, um, whenever one of the one of the data structures is the grid stored in the chunk. So whenever the, the chunk is destroyed, we want to clear the memory. And let's go ahead and do that un unload chunk. When we unload it, we want to cl clear the memory. Um, all right, so we have this grid and we want to get rid of it. So DS grid destroy a grid. Okay, so we're gonna deallocate all that. It's it's saved in this map, it's all it's all good. We're not gonna lose it. We but we do we no longer have need of this data structure. So we're gonna move that. Okay, that's one memory leak. The other other two data data structures that we're using is the chunk map and the chunk loaded set. And those we need the entire game, so we're going to need to destroy them once the game is over. So I'm going to jump over to our generator. And when the game's over, we're going to need to destroy those. So we're going to say DS map destroy um, chunk map. And then we're also going to want to destroy DS map destroy chunk loaded set. All right, that'll take care of that. Now there's another issue which occur which arises. Well, I'll go ahead and show it to you. Notice that's not fully set yet. If I hit space, it's still going up. 
I'd venture to guess that's less than it used to be, but it's still going up. So what's happening now is um, the chunks that are in the room, their grids don't, they're still, they haven't been destroyed when the game ends. They're, so their grids are still active. So the way I initially saw this is I went to the chunk and I basically added a game end here and said when the game ends, unload, your ch unload yourself. But the problem with that is that we don't really know what order the game ends happen. So maybe some of the chunks will have, have the game end, then the generator will have the game end, and then the chunks will finish up their game ends or something like that. And the issue with that is that in the game end for the generator, it actually destroys the chunk map. And those are referenced in the unload chunk over here, which causes issues. So we're going to actually go ahead and manually call unload chunk from the game end, from, from here to make sure everything has in the right order. So we're going to say with O chunk. So we're going to loop through all the chunks and we're going to tell them each to, to unload their unload themselves. And additionally, instance destroy. Let's go and do it. Well, actually, it doesn't really matter if we destroy it or not. Just unload themselves to get rid of all the data stuff. Now, when we hit play and for restart it over and over again, there shouldn't be any issues. Okay? Is it number 244, yada, yada, yada? It's exactly the same. All right. We've just fixed all of our memory leaks. And that's a good habit to get into when you're making games. I'm working on a large project right now, and I haven't been, I haven't been on top of this. So I get all kinds of weird crashes and stuff, and lots of data usage and lag, and it's pretty painful. So if you're on top from the beginning, that's ideal. OK, so we have all those fixed. OK, step 4.2 is over. Now we can move on to step 5, which is final notes. OK. so. If you are working on, if you want to implement this in your thing and your train generation isn't necessarily the same as mine, this is, like, what differences do you need to have? Well, the core things here, we have the load and unload chunk, and we have the point in despawn range and the point in spawn range, okay? So this point in spawn range and despawn range are going to be different depending on the game. So in our case, I just made it in a circle, which I believe is the way Minecraft does it, and it works for Minecraft because it's in a 3D space, and distance from the player represents how far you can see, so a circle kind of makes sense. But if it's a top-down game like this, a rectangle would probably make more sense. Okay? Um, and then, of course, you might want to tweak the, the ranges um, to, to avoid... Basically... You want to look at how often the player is moving, and you want to load in chunks as infrequently as possible. So you're going to want to tweak the chunk sizes, you're going to want to tweak the spawn ranges, you're going to tweak the despawn ranges in such a way that they're not they're loaded as infrequently as possible, but at the same time, you have as few loaded as possible. So you don't want overkill, you don't want to have, uh, load a bunch of them, at which point you'll never load more, but at the same time you're taking all kinds of memory with all these ex excessive chunks you loaded. So that's one extreme, and the other extreme is you barely load anything. You make each chunk the size of a block, and then you're constantly loading things, and that's bad as well. So you want to meet, meet a nice balance where you're not loading very much at a time, or you, you don't have, you're not taking a lot of memory with all the chunks you're loading, but at the same time, you're not loading a whole bunch of new chunks. Okay, So that's the balance you're trying to meet, and you're going to need to tweak that towards the game. Um, and, then, and the shape of these spawn regions and the size then is going to go into that. All right, that's that's the one thing. Next to this, loading chunks. So I kind of was able to um, work it out pretty nicely for me because I all the information for the chunk is stored in this grid, and I can just nicely convert it to a string using a built-in game maker function. That's probably not going to be as easy for you. You're going to do a little bit of soul searching to figure out what um, how big of data structure you need to store all the information for your chunk and also how do you store that data structure somewhat efficiently. So you could you could create a script to convert it over to a string somehow and write to to a map like this which works well and that's also good because if you're using GameMaker there's a hand, handy dandy function which I've never used before but I I found quite exciting which is DS map uh, save secure or secure secure save that's it. So this goes ahead and efficiently stores the map in a, in onto a file and then you can easily load it from the file afterwards. So that's nice. 
Um, if you can if you can use the functionality of your engine to do that, that that's that's of course ideal. But you might be in the situation where you'd write out yourself and write make a script to convert all your information over to a string and then write all line by line to file and then create another thing to read line by line from the file and convert it over back over. Yeah. It could get messy. Um but yeah, that's something that you're gonna need to figure out and you can need a little bit of soul searching to figure out the perfect way that that would work for your game. Because of course there's different ways to do train generation, there's different amounts of information that you'll need per chunk and and whatnot. But not. I believe that's everything I wanted to talk about. So, so these four scripts are basically the ones you're going to be tweaking to your own game. I believe the rest of it is going to be relatively uh, resistant to change. It's going to be re relatively generalized to any project, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay, that is all for this tutorial. Thank you so much for watching. If you use this, please let me know. I'm always curious to see how people use this. So. If you have a project you're working on, I'd be happy to hear about it and and see how my tutorial is being put to use. Um, let's see what else. What else? You know, rate, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Show your support is always welcomed. Um, if you're enjoying this Pearl and Noise stuff, I'm not done yet. I I'm well, I'm almost done. I think I've got one more Unity tutorial coming out, and I'm thinking I might finish it off with a a montage of all kinds of stuff you can do with Pearl and Noise because Pearl and Noise is just so cool. Um, yeah, so I think I might I might mess around with the shaders some. So if you want to if you want to see how Pearl and Noise can be generated using the shaders, subscribe and you can see that. Okay, I think that's more or less everything. Most of you probably stopped watching by now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next tutorial.